Thank you guys for uh, letting me speak this afternoon. So this is essentially kind of a follow-on or a sequel to the uh, presentation that my colleague from Gabby Beth Evans gave this morning. So she was talking about the application window that we like to open this year that would potentially involve Gabby providing uh, rapid diagnostic tests. But we realized that RDTs you know, are not necessarily the only type of tests that are needed for um, cholera. And so and I'm going to go through a few slides to explain how it's possible that in the future, maybe as early as next year, we could add an additional component to Gavi cholera diagnostic procurement support to also cover molecular testing, such as PCR testing. So I'm going to explain the, the rationale and, and what would need to happen to make that possible. So um, the... Uh, as, as Beth mentioned this morning, the, the key issue for, for Gavi is that basically we are hoping that uh, or expect that improved diagnostic testing for cholera could help us to make more efficient and more effective use of oral cholera uh, vaccine. So specifically, especially around helping us in countries uh, with the, the planning and targeting of oral cholera vaccine preventive campaigns. So we, our hypothesis is that if we can use data or countries can use data on diagnostic confirmed cholera to help guide planning for preventive campaigns, instead of using data on suspected cholera cases or acute watery diarrhea cases, then that will allow us to essentially have more efficient and more effective OCD preventive campaigns. In other words, we're making sure that we're doing the campaigns in areas that actually have cholera, um, as opposed to just areas that have acute watery diarrhea. And that's going to be especially important as we get into the potential for future repeat preventive OCD campaigns. So uh, the, the campaigns are currently under planning this wouldn't have any effect on, but it's quite possible that in three to five years, uh, when countries are trying to figure out, is it worth doing an, another preventive campaign in the area where one has already been done or an outbreak response has been done recently, that data from uh, diagnostic testing, you know, confirming whether or not cholera is an area or not could be really critical for helping guide those kinds of decisions. Mm -hmm. And the part of the reason it's important is that Gabby really has made a major commitment to trying to uh, support cholera vaccination um, with over $200 million allocated for the 2021 through 2025 period alone. Um, so the even if we only have a small impact on how the campaigns are operated, it can still have very large absolute effects. So, okay. Um, so the uh, we expect that rapid diagnostic tests would be the mainstay of testing for all the reasons that the GTFCC has been focusing on them or talking about them for the last you know six years and why it's there, there's such a mainstay of of uh, y'all's efforts to improve cholera surveillance and diagnosis. But we also think that molecular tests could potentially be useful in complementing RDTs, particularly in helping with quality assurance and assessing toxicity. So what we basically see is. Uh, cholera molecular tests being part of a larger system, again, alongside RDTs. Uh, just as an example, we think that uh, molecular testing of, of samples of positive and negative RDTs could potentially be very useful for monitoring the performance of RDTs. In other words, we know there have been research studies which have shown that you can take uh, a cholera RDT and then essentially extract some um, of the uh, genetic material from it and then run it through a PCR test. So that might be one way of getting the samples for in for testing. And so one way that could be quite relevant is that as you guys know, cholera rapid diagnostic test sensitivity and specificity has been shown to vary um, in different settings. So where different studies have shown different sensitivity and specificity in different areas. And the uh, we think that molecular testing of some of those RDTs or samples of those RDTs could be helpful for indicating what's the actual RDT accuracy in a given place. In other words, you know, a country could could be using RDTs and then test some of them against molecular testing to kind of get a sense for how do the RDTs perform against the gold standard in their country. Uh, so then the incident, if you have, so once you have a better sense, what's the actual sensitivity and specificity of an RDT in a given country in a given time, then you can potentially take the incidence for, of cholera that you'd be using um, based on, on RDT results and then adjust it based on the molecular testing results to get what's probably closer to the actual incidents with the incidents potentially being a key factor in deciding where to do preventive campaigns. So, and as I mentioned, um, we fully recognize that molecular testing can also be useful for distinguishing toxigenic um, vibrio cholera from non-toxigenic, which can be critical for questions, for example, around outbreak response. So we, as a, in terms of, from an organizational perspective, we would expect that RDTs would be used on decentralized basis, whereas molecular testing would be much more centralized in, in reference laboratories. 
So as a reminder, these are the countries that are eligible for Gavi new vaccine support. We would hope that if um, Gavi does get involved with procuring um, uh, molecular tests as, as well as RDTs, that this would actually potentially have spillover benefits for other countries in terms of by helping to energize the market, it might attract more manufacturers and, and lower prices and have better, higher quality products. But the countries that are um, shaded here are really the focus of, of what Gavi could actually help with in terms of procurement support. So in terms of what would happen with molecular testing, it is um, potentially possible for Gavi funding to be used for buying not only test kits, but also type of consumable supplies that you would need to actually use the kits, such as centrifuge tubes and pipette tips, as well as potentially equipment needed to run commercial collar molecular diagnostic tests that were shown to work. Now, hopefully that won't be a huge issue because there's so much PCR equipment floating around thanks to the COVID pandemic, but it's at least it's a, it's a possibility if there's a real need. Um, the as um, Ms. Evans noted this morning, the country governments would eventually need to fund procurement of these supplies. In other words, Gavi procurement support would hopefully last for, for years, um, but it's not going to last forever. So the expectation um, is that the transition of financial responsibility um, would be gradual with co-financing starting within a few years of the start of Gavi procurement funding support, but it would not be immediate and it would be quite gradual. Incidentally, just as an aside, the and when we've worked through the estimates on how much the co-financing for um, diagnostic tests for cholera, typhoid, meningococcus, measles, rubella, and yellow fever might cost Gavi eligible countries once that's all in place, assuming all countries are using all those tests. It can't worked out to me about 3% of the amount of money countries are spending on vaccine co-financing. So when we talk about co-financing, it's a very, very small amount compared to the amounts that normally come up in our vaccine discussions. Uh, and the other thing is I mentioned in terms of spillover benefits. So any tests that Gavi is procuring would be through UNICEF. But that also means that uh, uh, governments that have agreements with UNICEF could buy tests at UNICEF prices, the same price as Gavi be paying through the UNICEF procurement system. So this would not be limited. There, there would be essentially some access for non-Gavi countries as long as they could find alternate sources of funding. The uh, so I mentioned commercially available tests really important. The reason is that um, and this is partially based on my experience with helping to improve yellow fever diagnostic testing. Commercial tests have a number of major advantages over, for example, in-house tests. If you're trying to scale up testing over a large area, they're standardized, uh, and uh, uh, the kind of manufacturers that we deal with have quality assurance practices in place, we'd have some confidence that the test kits actually are fairly uniform and do meet minimum quality standards in terms of, of uh, uh, good manufacturing practices. Also, if you're using a standardized test kit um, with a standardized protocol, it becomes much easier to scale it up in terms of training and then also doing quality assessments. So you don't have to, you have some sense what everybody should be doing if you're doing, for example, doing an external quality assurance panel and, and quality checks, as opposed to having to take into account variations you might see with an in-house pro protocol. So the at the moment, there's a number of tests on the market um, for molecular tests, three actually, that are CEIBD, in other words, the manufacturer promises that they work. Um, that's not quite good enough. Um, we're very big fans of trust but verify when it comes to uh, test quality assurance at Gavi. So we would want to see um, uh, tests that are either have uh, basically, they have some kind of endorsement or recommendation from WHO, ideally a WHO pre-qualification, although um, uh, an interim recommendation from a WHO expert review panel would also be sufficient. But the point is, the tests that, that are currently in the market are in that yellow box of CIBD, and we need to find some that after independent evaluations that Gavi can fund actually meet that top level of, of of um, quality assurance where we basically have WHO telling us that the test probably works based on a rigorous evaluation. So how to go from where we are now to potentially Gavi buying molecular tests and shipping them out. So there's a bunch of things need to happen. First, we need to be able to basically articulate to manufacturers what we actually want out of a test kit. Um, and for that, we need the development of target product profiles. Now the GTFCC developed a target product profile for um, uh, RDT some years ago, which was quite helpful. So the so you know so we would be looking for WHO to lead the development of it with potentially support from the foundation for new diagnostics to lead the development of a target product profile for molecular test kits 
Um, so again, we can essentially tell the world what we're looking for and effectively what Gabby would be willing to pay for. We also need to put together a test evaluation protocol to basically say, okay, we know what we want. How do we figure out if the tests actually meet those specifications? And so that would include components around um, what would an independent laboratory evaluation need to look like. So the manufacturers would need to provide test kits that a uh, independent lab could use um, to see how they, they perform against uh, the, the lab's um, own gold standard, but also would have to get information on, as I said, good manufacturing practices and quality control, as well as the information the manufacturer has themselves about um, uh, how well the tests perform. The as I mentioned, there's the good news is that there's three tests on the market. The manufacturers have enough confidence in that they've told the European Union these tests actually work. So that's what a CEIVD mark means. And then there's 15 tests on the market where the manufacturers basically said this is for research use only. We don't know if this thing works or not. Buyer beware. So we could also take a look at those. But usually the CIVD tests are the ones that are are more likely to um, to go through in these types of evaluations. But the point is, there's 18 tests in the market. So if we can if we can get TPPs that articulate what we're looking for, there's actually stuff out there that might work. Um, we just need to be able to figure out what's the criteria for determining that, and then run some of these tests through those criteria. So let's say, so when we get to the point, we actually have a test that we have confidence works and it's worth buying and scaling up. Then we also are going to need development of clear guidance on how to distribute uh, collar molecular test kits and supplies across the country. In other words, some way of figuring out um, how many tests are needed. That's very useful for countries for their own planning. It's also critical for Gavi so that we know basically how much to budget for. It's not, and it can't be uh, some kind of blank check. You know, there has to be some real consideration about how do you organize the testing as efficiently as possible. In other words, minimizing costs, because as I mentioned, the financial responsibility for paying for this is eventually going to devolve to the countries. So it doesn't make sense to, buy, to, to develop a really, really, really elaborate system. There's no way it can be paid for um, uh, after the Gavi funding stops. It needs to be something that can be got in place with Gavi funding and, and you know, and be maintained with some support from Gavi in, in procurement, but it also needs to be something that can eventually be transitioned to the countries. And then finally, once these elements are in place, the country needs to, will need to submit applications to Gavi for Gavi funding support. So uh, with RDTs, we're already at that last stage, which is in a lot of ways, which is great, but we just, we have even more steps to get through to go to get there with molecular tests. And I think it will take at least a year. So the good news is that the um, the steps I mentioned it is feasible and this this can work because we've done it um, with partners at WHO and UNICEF and CDC Foundation for New Diagnostics Institute Pasteur Dakar Center Pasteur Cameroon UBRI uh, the um, uh, Robert Koch Institute and the um, Institute for Tropical Medicine Antwerp you know with those groups working together we've gone through these same steps with yellow fever. So we started trying to address yellow fever diagnostic testing gaps in 2018. At the time, there were no tests in the market that we knew worked. I had several people tell me it was impossible to fix anything. Um, so it was not looking good. Um, and then the WHO Yellow Fever Laboratory Network developed target product profiles and evaluation criteria for, figure, for determining what kind of yellow fever molecular tests were needed in 2019. WHO organized an evaluation of WHO yellow fever commercial molecular test kits in 2021, and sorry, 2020 and 2021 was completed in 2021. And then the, the end result was that they determined that one of the kits in the market, the Altona Real Star Yellow Fever Kit, worked. It was worth scaling up. So now validated yellow fever molecular test kits are being shipped to reference laboratories across Africa to try to detect um, yellow fever, which is great because it's a lot faster than the alternative tests. And it's, the other thing is that the interest for manufacturers has increased now that we've demonstrated there's some market. So we, we did the first evaluation in 2020. Altona was the only company that applied. We're doing another round of evaluations now. We've had seven companies apply to have their yellow fever molecular test kits um, um, evaluated. So the the, so this, you know, and yellow fever, by the way, is a much smaller market than I think cholera would be. So we can use with yellow fever, it can also work for cholera. But again, the key thing is that we've got to have the development of these target product profiles and evaluation criteria. Um, and that's a really critical bottleneck. And as soon as that happens, then I think the other parts will start moving much faster. All right. I'm very happy to take any questions. Okay. Duncan, please go ahead. 
Uh, sure. Um, yeah, thanks, Lee. I, I guess my question comes from a very specific Gates Foundation uh, perspective, and that is, what can I do to help you actually get this through? Because it feels like this is just draggy. I know you've been doing a lot of work. Is do we have TPPs? Uh, do we that have been developed? If there are these eighteen um, RDTs out there. What kind of field evaluation do you need with the network here? And what can we do to help just accelerate that? The the good news is that um, the, the sticking point at this point really is the TPP and evaluation criteria. And Nadia, and, and I've been talking this for a while, I'm hopeful, and Nadia, sorry to put you on the spot, that once Nadia no longer has to plan this meeting, um, that uh, you know things will help. What, one thing that has also helped is that Find has actually been drafting draft TPPs. Um, the uh, yeah, they asked me last weekend. Um, so the so as a starting point. So I I think that uh, that's the key element. But honestly, the 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 person to ask on that is is really Nadia. Um, and I think we're happy to to talk about that further. Thank you. No, you're very right. Um, we are very close to sending out invitations for TPP development uh, as a start. And actually, so there'll be two activities happening in parallel. So the TPP development with the lab working group, although that said, here we're talking about TPPs for molecular diagnostics. Our very first step is going to be to review the TPPs for RDTs. So that will happen first. And we're going to work to make it happen soon. It shouldn't be a long process, but that would be the first thing we're looking at. And then once we move on to molecular diagnostics, so development of new TPPs, again, uh, for both of these activities, a lot of the lab working group members will be called, um, you know, to, to volunteer on. Uh, so look out for invitations in, in your mailboxes in, in, in case. Um, and then at this, the, the second sort of molecular diagnostics activity that would happen in parallel is uh, the work that Marie Locht spoke about, about uh, guidance for PCR. So they kind of go together there, right? The, having the lab working group think about guidance for PCR and um, a group of experts working on TPPs. Build a little bit more on that. Also note that um, you know if any groups are organizing their own evaluations of PCR kits right now, then I think those could be quite helpful for kind of feeding into the development of the protocol that I'm talking about and uh, as a starting point. And in large part due to Nadia's uh, uh, intercession with the WHO pre-qualification team, the good news is that if we can get the TPPs and the evaluation criteria set up, PQ has indicated that they will not make the tests go through the full PQ process, that they are willing to put together an expert review panel um, that would be using the TBPs and criteria that would be developed, I'm talking about here, and they think it would take about three months. So the, and the, another really helpful thing is that with yellow fever, one of our major problems has been just finding samples um, for the evaluation because there's not many yellow fever cases. I'm a lot less worried about that with cholera. Um, so, so the so the good news is that like some things that have been real bottlenecks um, for in other contexts, um, I, I, we've already been able to to address to some extent. But, but yeah, I, I definitely will take you up on that. On how can you guys help move things along whenever I can? Yeah. Um, do you want to go first? Okay. Um, so I guess what I heard is that the find is developing a TPP for the RDT. I, I appreciate that the molecular is kind of. That was for the molecular part. It's, it's, but, but again, it's a draft. She has to review it first, but I'm just saying that that's the kind of thing they can do to help. I, um, I assume that you draft the TPP and then you run through a kind of process of validating, maybe even checking it in country and 
seeing how things work. So that's where we are. Um, okay. So do you want to explain it or should I? We can talk further. Now, just it, it is very correct. There is a whole process to follow to have validated TPPs, and that includes public consultation. That includes uh, having a representative uh, experts within the group that are that represent regions, that represent, you know, gender equity, etc. Um, so we're we're going to follow all those steps, and that is the part that takes time. Maybe. Yeah, and so just to give an example from meningococcal disease, the the first step was having an expert group and the, the working out the use cases, and then working out the specific product characteristics from that. And then that expert group goes through a few times. Once that's finished, then it goes out for public comment and a survey of potentially all relevant stakeholders um, to provide feedback on the characteristics. And the expert group gets together one more time to. To hash something out the fastest i've seen that happen is four months the slowest um it's, has been about eight so far if you don't mind a couple of questions online that, that should uh be uh, not take too much time uh will gavi support for molecular testing also cover capacity building eqa quality monitoring as well as equipment maintenance and then another uh, somewhat similar question. One of the major needs for WHO Afro region is for culture supplies, so media, et cetera. Are there prospects to support these? So I'm going to take the first question, second question first. Unfortunately, no. Um, culture is out of bounds um, for a couple of reasons. One is that the uh, one of the main reasons for Gavi to get involved with any product, cold chain equipment, vaccines, diagnostic testing, is if there's essentially some kind of market failure where the issue is that there's not enough demand to keep manufacturers engaged in terms of developing innovative products. So that very much applies with diagnostic tests. Um, especially when you're talking about ones that you know that work. Um, it does not apply as much to culture. The other issue is that Gavi in the past actually has tried to fund efforts to scale up culture, and it hasn't gone very well. Um, the It's basically, from our perspective, much more difficult to scale up culture capacity than it is to scale up um, something like RDTs and PCR testing. So the So if uh, and given the, the ability to use PCR testing for confirmation, that is our very strong preference. And to put it even more crudely, there's no way I'm going to get money out of culture for the, from, the, for the, from the Gabby board. They'll never pay for it. Um, okay, on the first question in terms of scope, that's a much more positive answer. Um, so the, the, when the board authorized Gabby engagement diagnostic testing, they actually did agree to include quality assurance, um, multi-country trainings, um, as well as um, uh, some degree of equipment purchases um, as part of that. We can't fund out of, so Beth mentioned this morning that there is Gavi funding available through health system strength and TCA funding for country specific capacity building. And that is true. But we also have the option, especially when we're dealing with reference laboratories, that we can fund um, through partners like WHO, uh, the organization of regional trainings um, around tests. That's worked very well with Yellow Fever. So the Yellow Fever Laboratory Network in Africa has organized at this point about five trainings, no, sorry, nine, um, for all the reference laboratories in Africa where they get together at regional reference laboratories and go through trainings on new types of Yellow Fever tests. We can certainly do that. We can also um, help fund uh, the um, you know WHO staff, for example, to go visit laboratories and and help with essentially quality checks or accreditation checks as well as training, and we can fund develop um, the production distribution of EQA panels. However, I'll point out all of these things only happen if we first figure out what kind of tests we need, how they're going to be distributed, and evaluated. But but the point is, there actually is with because the original model we had was a Yale fever laboratory network. There is some funding available to address those broader laboratory network elements if needed. You just need a lab network first. Yes. Yes, just to complement uh, 
Nadia, a uh, question about the capacity building. I mean, before, I mean, we go to the qualities and the, and the I mean, the equipment, the PCR. I mean, we all know that uh, huge uh, enhancements have been done for virology laboratories, but the bacteriology laboratories, I mean, and they are very weak. They don't know what is molecular. They have never used the PCR. They have never used the, they, We need to introduce the PCR to them. So before we need equipment, we need, because they don't have access to the virology lab. They can for just one time, I mean, to confirm one, one but they will, they will never have access to the, for monitoring and to use it. Yeah, so um, the, uh, so just again, using the CLFU for example, when we started, um, the refrain I got from about half the laboratory experts in Africa was that nobody in Africa could do, was doing or could do yellow fever PCR testing. It was hopeless. So we actually, Gavi fund with WHO developed a protocol for the evaluation of the different yellow fever refer reference laboratories, very similar to the work you guys have been doing. We, we hired a group of consultants who visited every yellow fever reference lab in Africa and assessed their capacity. It turned out 70% of them were already doing molecular testing um, for yellow fever, which was great. They just were all using strange processes. But the point is, we not only have the funding to pay for equipment, we also have funding to pay for assessments to see if the equipment is actually needed and what are the what's the current training status and what kind of additional training is needed. So I completely understand what you're saying, and it's potentially within scope, but we also have the money to figure out what's the actual situation. Um, so the uh, so yeah, but I will also note, you guys have to keep in mind, we can't pay for fun, treat for the, the diagnosis of every single type of bacterial disease known to man, or at least especially enteric bacterial disease. It really does have to be focused on cholera. <laughs> 